Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. This is a very special edition that we are excited about. I have followed the career of today's guest for several years, and he just published a new book called Don't Save for Retirement, A Millennial's Guide to Financial Freedom. And it is fun, fast, and brilliant. Our guest today is Mr. Daniel Amadori. Daniel is a top figure within the financial newsletter business. He is one of the first to have covered Bitcoin at $13, which made his readers millions of dollars in the process. He is also one of the first to cover passive income opportunities and also real estate funding and private lending. So this is going to be an amazing interview. Daniel, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing great after that introduction. Well, thank you so much. Oh, it is fantastic. Such an exciting time. And I want to tell your personal story just as a nutshell to everyone so that they understand where you're coming from. Daniel began as a real estate investor when he was still a teenager. He was one of the first people within his family to graduate from high school. He achieved amazing success and became a multimillionaire. Then, Everything was wiped away in the real estate crash of 2007. Daniel went into an emotional crash himself, sleeping all day and working at a grocery store at night just to make ends meet. But he was able to summon up the courage to try again. And within eight short years, he had surpassed his original fortune. In his new book, it is a blueprint of how he did it. It's a fascinating read. And I want to mention to everyone where to find it. It's an ebook on Daniel's website. The link is at futuremoneytrends.com slash save. And with that overview, Daniel, let's start off with your key habits. Since you were not instilled by your family with the habits of wealth, what habits did you develop? And can you actually teach financial principles to all of us so that everyone can implement them? Yeah, luckily, it, the, the, the strategies that I, I've come across and that helped me are, have been used for thousands of years by wealthy people. I do want to mention, though, you have the ebook option, but there's a physical copy as well on Amazon. So just search Don't Save for Retirement or you can go to futuremoneytrends.com slash save. And I actually have the first chapter and intro which starts with me and my wife at a bankruptcy attorney's office, uh, free. So the, the, one of the biggest and the most important habits that I've uh, conditioned my mind is to buy assets that cash flow. And it seems easy, but actually it's a big change. You know, middle class and uh, poor are trying to always get rich overnight, or they're buying into a 401k and they're hoping it goes up, or they're investing into a penny stock and hoping it goes up. It's always based on hope and it needs to go up. The rich, because they're already rich, they have the luxury of not investing that way. They have the uh, advantage of taking their time, more like an alligator that's hunting, buying when the time looks good, and then sitting on it and allowing those dividends and the cash flow to come in into their lives and have multiple streams of income. So probably the most important discipline and habit that I've, I've trained my brain is to really focus on things that have a criteria of, will there be a check or an ACH coming into my account monthly, quarterly, annually from this investment? Excellent, passive income. Now, Daniel, your book is called Don't Save for Retirement. So do you believe that the idea of retirement has become an unattainable notion? You know, I think it's more of a failed experiment. Uh, it, it worked for the first people to try it. Many of them, because it's like, you know, the top of a pyramid for some of these pensions uh, uh, systems or social security, for example, first person put in like $28 and 50 cents and then proceeded to pull out $60,000. So of course it worked for that first group. Uh, but it's relatively a new experiment uh, in today's form. So the 401k, it's only been around since the 80s. The legislation was passed in the 70s, but implemented in the 80s. Same thing for the IRAs and all this explosion of mutual funds. So I think what happened is, is it was an experiment and people treat it as if it's, you know, been around for a thousand years or 2000 years. When in reality, today's conventional retirement is a relatively new idea and the baby boomers who had the best stock market, best housing market, best bond market, it didn't work out. So if it didn't work out for a generation that had it set up like that, I don't think it's gonna work out at all. So I, I look at it as um, it's not even something worth pursuing at this point. 
uh, according to Vanguard, who handles most of the retirement accounts around the world for 401ks, uh, they said the average 401k holder in their accounts has, oh, excuse me, not even average, median, has $47,000 in it, or $58,000 in it, excuse me, over 65 and older. I mean, that lets you know, if, if that was the baby boomer generation. You can only imagine what's going to happen to the millennials and Gen Xers. So, my idea is forget about it and really start focusing on what the rich have been doing for thousands of years. The largest institutions in the world, like insurance company and banks, they're not speculating. They're buying income. They're loaning money out and looking for a yield. Exactly. Follow the money. And it's interesting. People don't realize how transient stuff is. They grow up, you know, with what they have been used to the last 30 years of their life and what their parents were used to. But a hundred years ago, that didn't exist and everything's a cycle. So nothing is here to stay forever. So this is a fantastic new vantage point. And from your vantage point, is the game of wealth rigged against most people? And if so, how so? I think the game is rigged because they've been getting bad information. First of all, they handicap people uh, in school because they're, te they're not teaching them anything about money ever. Um, I mean, maybe you'll learn how to write a check, but that's about the extent of it. And I'm shocked to learn actually from a lot of friends who have uh, degrees in finance and business, same thing. They're telling me, Dan, there's none of, nothing about personal finance and even in college, which is like shocking. So I think they, they've handicapped people with the education system. And then they've also uh, conditioned them to a lot of, to agree to a lot of things that shouldn't be normal, like taking out a three decade loan for a home or a seven, eight year auto loan for financing, 0% interest to buy furniture, you know, so they've conditioned society to accept a lot of things that today we perceive as normal, but in reality, it's, it's an unsustainable lifestyle. So I think it's rigged in the sense that the middle class has been getting a lot of bad information and shocking as this may seem, some of the best investments that I have, I talk about in the book, don't save for retirement and that I've used, it's actually illegal for them to advertise these investments to the public. So the rich are using them. The biggest owners of some of these investments are the banks. The second biggest owners are probably some companies like Walmart and fortune 500 companies and then rich people. Uh, but it's not even advertised to the middle class, but it's fully accessible to them. Isn't that amazing that the tricks they use to build phenomenal wealth is actually illegal to tell the rest of us. I think that's such an extraordinary point, Dan. Yeah. It's, it's shameful to be honest with you that it's not, you know, especially with what's going on in people's 401ks today and other alternatives that they try to use for retirement. Meanwhile, here are all these very safe investments that pay a dividend, that have cash flow. Historically, some of these companies have been around for hundreds of years since the 1700s, never missed a dividend payment. The rich have so much money in them. The presidential candidates of the last, you know, 50 years, Walt Disney, uh, you know, all these people, but the middle class, it's actually not advertised to at all. That's incredible. Now it's illegal to advertise it, but it's not illegal to talk about it, mm -hmm. right? So you can spread the word and you can yes. educate people about this. It's just that they can't advertise to benefit anyone. Absolutely. So. You can't see it on like a, a publication of, of, you don't see it on Fox business or CNBC. Instead, you'll just see them pushing mutual funds and ETFs and all these schemes where uh, wall street makes money. Wow. It really, knowledge is power. I mean, that really brings it home. Now, Daniel, your book reflects the fact that the United States is changing rapidly from a society and an economy based on the whims of baby boomers to one which is based upon the needs and wants of millennials. Numbers wise, the demographics indicate that there are now more millennials than boomers and together they make up about half of the population. How specifically is the United States changing and how will our economy evolve with the millennial surge? you bring up a great point because the millennials and, and the generations younger than them have been trained for an economy that does not exist. They've entered into a freelance economy. They've entered into an economy that doesn't require a college degree for nearly half the jobs college graduates are getting. Uh, oftentimes they're, they're too late. I know people who got software in, uh, degrees and they go to work for HBO and 
HBO is like kicking them out. Like go, go relearn everything that you just learned for the last four years. Here's a three week training course because everything you learned is outdated. I mean, you think about some of the largest companies on the planet weren't around 11 years ago, Instagram, Facebook. I mean, these companies, Netflix, uh, they were around, but they weren't streaming and uh, Uber, all these companies that have active roles in our life weren't around. Uh, even Amazon is only 20 years old. Uh, and that, that's changed everybody's life. So, and as well as, as well as, uh, you know, all these different technologies. So things are changing radically. Now, the, the easy thing to do for a lot of people is to complain about it and say, it's not like my parents had it, or it's not like, but you know what? It's never been that way. And it's actually getting better. And, and in the book, don't say for retirement, I talk about how the millennials need to really embrace what they have. You can start a business for $10 at GoDaddy. Uh, you can become a freelance for pretty much anything. I mean, I, I, there's websites where you can literally sell your skills if you want to offer that. So the mobility for millennials and the opportunities to make income or even be part of investments that weren't uh, uh, possible before. So uh, let's say crowdfunding, for example, a lot of these companies like Fundrise and Pure Street, you can get involved in those now uh, with crowdfunding where you buy $25 worth of somebody's $400,000 mortgage and make money like the banks. But just prior to 2012, that was actually illegal for that to be opened up to the public. So who was investing in that? Well, hedge funds, institutions, insurance companies. So there's a lot of good with the change, but you have to embrace the change and that's difficult for some. But the fact of the matter is, look, if you're telling a millennial kid or somebody who's graduating college or a high school this year, hey, just go to college and go get your business degree and you climb up the corporate ladder, you're preparing them for the past, that's gone. Because people don't realize too, looking back, you know, um, how many things have changed. And it's so true, everything's different within the past two decades for sure. But the past one decade has really changed the world. I mean, when we're talking about cryptocurrencies and new industries like cannabis and things that, you know, you can invest in now as far as crowdfunding that you just mentioned. So opening your eyes to what's out there can really be phenomenal. It's an incredibly exciting time, right? That's why I'm so excited about your book. I mean, the, the possibilities are amazing right now. Yeah, no, I'm very optimistic for young people or anybody who reads the book. Honestly, I've got people who are 60 years old who, who read the book and they're very excited to make some adjustments in their, into their life. And again, for your listeners, we have a free uh, landing page for them. They, they can easily get the first chapter book in the intro, as well as get my weekly wealth digest at futuremoneytrends.com slash save. And it's free. Of course, there's an Amazon link if they want to buy the book. But uh, I think honestly, just reading the intro and the first chapter uh, I think will really help uh, uh, them give the nice mind shift. Absolutely. Everybody should go read it. It's free and it, it's such a fantastic read. Now switching gears just a bit to politics, Dan, what is your perspective on president Trump? How would you summarize his presidency and what are your thoughts about the 2020 election? For President Trump, uh, I think he's a very consequential president, whether you hate him or love him. He's very consequential. Uh, he's done, I want to say about 200 federal judges that will impact the country for the next two to three decades on how they rule, whether it's in favor of government or in favor of the individual. Uh, so I think that's a positive because these judges will most likely favor the individual uh, over, over what the federal government wants. And he's also, um, he's a great disruptor, again, for better, or for worse. I mean, look, people who hate uh, politics, this guy took down the Clintons and the Bushes in the same year. So that dynasty, those dynasties that probably would have sent us to more wars is gone. And as far as 2020, I think, I mean, it, it sounds crazy because I, I did predict that Trump would actually win the nomination before even the Iowa caucus. And I predict that if he got the nomination, he would ultimately get an electoral landslide. I think Trump is set up for a win uh, based on the uh, swing states. So as you know, I mean, look, we can talk about California and all these states, but in the end, these, it comes down to about 10 states. And if you look at what he's done for manufacturing uh, and some of these uh, states where, that are going to tip the election, I think that he's set up for at least an electoral college win. I don't know if he's going to win the popular vote. He might lose that again, but certainly in the electoral league, I don't see what's changed in the last four years for Florida and um, Ohio, which he will most likely win reelection with. And then what has changed though, for you ask anybody in Michigan, 
I don't care if they're hardcore liberal or, or Republican or they don't care. Ask anybody, go on a blog, read some news articles about what's happened in Detroit. Detroit has seen a full blown resurgence. Uh, I've never seen anything like this, honestly. Was, and now these opportunity zones that were part of the tax cut, they're just getting in, into that. And they, these are zones that are uh, each state got to pick their underperforming cities. And now you've got billions of dollars flooding into these cities. I mean, I think he's set up for a reelection. Uh, as we know from the leaked New York Times, they're going to talk about racism, racism, racism for the next year and a half. But it's cr what's crazy is this: um, his African American support. Traditionally, Republicans have about eight to nine percent on African American support. His is around twenty-five to twenty-eight percent, and I'm talking about Gallup and Zogby. These aren't like Republican polls or something. If you even shipped away, if he just doubled that number from 8% to 16%, uh, the Democrats can't win. So I think despite, unless they come out with like Michelle Obama or somebody, America would be like, okay, look, I can, I can, I'd probably rather have Michelle Obama president. You know what I mean? Like, I don't see, I don't see the current group. I mean, really are, is, are people going to get excited over Warren or, or Biden who's got like Alzheimer's disease? You know, you make such an important point because the Democratic landscape right now is just an embarrassment. I mean, honestly, I mean, if you look at those people and then you compare them to Trump, um, do you really want someone like that going up against China or Russia? Do you really believe that they could go in and really take hold of what we need right now in the world? Because the world is a, a, a very potently dangerous place if you are weak. Yeah. No, and you're right. I, I just don't see, I don't see a candidate out there. I, I, there are for sure people out there who could beat Trump, but you know, as far as a candidate and I think, you know, America that put uh, Trump in, they were mad at politicians. So I, I almost think the Democrats are making a big mistake. They've got 20 candidates, but they're all politicians. They need, um, you know, they chased off the Starbucks guy. He would have been a great candidate. Um, you know, because the thing is with, with business owners or a lot of people who were, were wobbler on Trump, they might turn away from Trump if the alternative wasn't so bad. You know, if it was Howard Schultz, like, okay, well, Mark Cuban. Okay, look, well, honestly, if Trump wins or Mark Cuban wins, I can, I'm fine with either one. I'm fine with either outcome. But what they give you is they give you Trump versus nuts on parade. And that's the problem. You're like, there's no way I can't have this other person in office. <laughs> that's on parade i mean it's so true they, it's a lineup of crazies I mean, who's crazier and then they try to out crazy each other yes. you know in their debates <laughs> the the thing is somebody's got to ask them do you do you, okay if, if you don't support having a border uh do you even support having a country you're running for the president of the united states <laughs> exactly if you don't have a border you don't have a country yeah period that's it. Now, focusing back on your book, Don't Save for Retirement, I think that one of the most potent facts is that you worked so hard and you built up so much prosperity. You did something most people don't ever do, becoming a multimillionaire on your own without a college education. And then to have it all wiped away and to actually start over again, take us back to that time, what happened and how you felt inside when everything crashed and how were you able to stand back up again and turn it around? The only reason I was able to stand back up and turn it around was because of my wife's support and encouragement. Because honestly, since I was a boy, I thought that I was destined to be financially free and independent and wealthy. Never, never cared about materialism, never dreamed about a big house or a car or boat or nothing. I just wanted to be free. I didn't want people telling me what to do. And so I knew that was my path. And then when I blew myself up in 2008, really I was depressed. I was not well. I was thinking it was over at that point. I was ready to throw in the towel. I mean, I probably even considered like, doing dangerous things a few times, just like not, I didn't act on it, of course, but I just like, I was looking at all my options. Like I really screwed up. And if it was not for the encouragement and support of my wife, that just none of this would be here right now. And uh, it was her that, and I together that we did this. And in the book, actually, there's something called Jules Corner that the, the listeners, uh, it also, so as I talk, it, it, it takes breaks uh, to hear my wife's perspective on what was going on like with her. Cause you know, when we sacrificed like to pay off our debt, one of the first things she did was to uh, sell our, her wedding ring. And I didn't know it until 
she wrote this part for the book, but she said she was really nervous about even saying that because she didn't want it to be rude or she didn't want me to be uh, hurt by it. And I had no idea for the last 10 years that, that she even had those feelings, but she did. She sold that ring and then she wore an $800 fake ring uh, for, for years and years and years. Even when we, when we had the millionaire net worth status and then financial independence and all these things, she never said anything about the ring. I replaced her ring now. Uh, but be, prior to that, like she sold it, never said anything. We did crazy things. I mean, we cut expenses. We moved to the desert. We got rid of our pets. I mean, we did, uh, deep cuts that a lot of people might not be willing to do, but we were really trying to create this thing called a financial moat for us. And we just wanted to like, okay, how do we not be poor? And how do we get my wife to quit her job? Because her ultimate passion and, and purpose was to be a mother. She's very passionate about being a mother. So she was like, how do I quit my job? She's like, well, if you can't make that much money, uh, you know, working for a grocery store, we're going to have to cut our way to independence. And so it, it turns out it's a combination of cutting your way to independence for the short term, by the way, this is not long term. Uh, and then uh, buying passive income. So instead of buying investments that may or may not prove to work in 30 years, you're actually buying things that send checks to your mailbox. Wow. It's such an amazing story. And then to build yourself back up to where you are, you've um, surpassed where you were substantially. What's one of the best nutshells you can tell everybody right now? Just pull it from your book. You know, I think one of the most important things is knowing what you want in life and what your purpose is. A lot of us get stuck in the routine of, hey, I'm, I'm going to get a job and then I'm going to go to work and sit in traffic. I'm going to come home and just watch TV. I've got my wine on Friday nights and it just routine, 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 routine. And I think you would just kind of step back and ask yourself, am I happy? Am I happy doing what I'm doing? If I'm not, what can I do? And in the book, I talk about a way to find your purpose. There are several different uh, strategies I use. One of my favorites is simply saying, what do you want people to say at your funeral? I know it sounds morbid, but what you're looking for is what those people, what you want them to say, that's exactly where you need to be. If you're like, I want them to say I was a, an amazing father. I want them to say that I was the best business person or I had, I had a great business that over delivered for people, whatever that you want them to say, that's where you need to be. So if you want, if you want them to say you're, you were a great father, then that's what you need to start doing right now. Fantastic. Daniel, this has been an amazing interview and your book leaves the reader with such a focused plan and a, a surge of energy to make it happen, which I think is the biggest thing because you can read every advice book in the world and then you put it away and you get back to your routine. This one is different. Please remind everyone where they can go to get a copy of your book and to follow your work. Yeah, you can get a copy at Amazon. Uh, just search Don't Save for Retirement. But I'd highly recommend first go to futuremoneytrends.com slash save read the intro, read the first chapter free. And you'll also receive my weekly wealth digest, which is completely free. It discusses a lot of the things my wife and I did on our journey and everything that we're investing in right now. Fantastic. What a wonderful story. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me on the show, Michelle. Mr. Daniel Amadori, financial strategist, real estate investor, and the author of the new book, Don't Save for Retirement, A Millennial's Guide to Financial Freedom. For the Industry Experts Panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.